Ipras, dear Betty, Monsieur le Doyen, cher euh, Enrico, cher Anne-Laure Kichel, Mesdames et Messieurs les professeurs, cher Stéphane Guibault, dear faculty, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It is a great honor to welcome you here to Sciences Po this evening, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. And I would like, first of all, to thank you very warmly for taking a bit of your time on this uh, Parisian visit to uh, see our students and to interact with them uh, during this lecture this evening. As you see, a great many of our students and faculty have chosen to, uh, to, to uh, register for this lecture. Uh, which has been much expected by all of us. So thank you very, very much indeed for being with us. You served as Prime Minister of Greece for more than four years, from 2015 to 2019. And as everyone here will remember, one of the many issues you had to deal with as Prime Minister was the one which we will have the good fortune of hearing uh, you talk about in a few moments, the Greek so sovereign debt crisis. The effects of the economic and financial crisis of 2008 are still being felt today in many European countries. But the crisis hit Greece, as we know, particularly hard. In 2009, faced with the state of Greece's public finances and the risk of sovereign default, then Prime Minister Georges Papandreou had no choice but to open negotiations with the country's three main donors, the so-called Troika, the IMF, the European Central Bank, and the European Commission. Severe austerity measures were put in place, and Greece succumbed to years of stark recession. The average well wage fell by more than 20%. Greek GDP lost nearly a third of its value, and the unemployment rate rose above 25%. And it was in this context that in January 2015, your party, Prime Minister, Syriza, won the legislative, legislative elections and that you became Prime Minister. The first months of your term were marked by complex and difficult negotiations with Greece's creditors. And to avoid what you described as a disaster, a disorderly bankruptcy for your country, as well as for a possible collapse of the European uh, uh, zone, the Eurozone, you accepted to sign an agreement that you do not believe in. And for those who remember, the situation was particularly critical at the time as due to insufficient liquidity, bank closures were paralyzing the Greek economy. The government debt crisis in Greece and the serious economic and financial consequences which it had and continues to have on the daily lives of Greek citizens illustrate just how critical the question of sovereign debt sustainability is for the management of a country's public affairs and government. And that is precisely the reason why we decided at Sciences Po to create a chair dedicated to the question of sovereign debts. The chair will bring together sovereign debt practitioners and renowned academics in economics, law, finance, history, international relations, and political science to rethink sovereign funding from a multidisciplinary perspective. Our intention is that through lectures, through uh, symposia, teaching courses, research, and publications, it will become uh, uh, one of the uh, places at Sciences Po, this chair will be one of the places uh, where this subject is thought of in a critical and interesting fashion in France and in Europe. Prime Minister, I'm delighted that we were able to officially launch this chair today by welcoming you to this inaugural conference. It will be a pleasure and an honor to hear your first-hand account, account and analysis of one of the most serious public debt crises faced by a member state of the European Union and the Eurozone. Before I conclude and hand over to, uh, to you, uh, Prime Minister, I would like to thank the person who's made it possible for us to create this chair and to launch it, uh, and the uh, institution uh, that's uh, enabled us to uh, create this chair, that is to say, Global Sovereign Advisory, represented this evening by its founder, Madame Anne-Laure Quichel, 
It is thanks to Global so Sovereign Advisory's trust, support, and constant presence at our side that we embark enthusiastically on this great venture. And Anne-Laure Kichel will explain the reasons for her involvement and that of her firm in this initiative in a moment. I would like also to express my sincere thanks to all the staff who have worked hard to establish the chair. I'm thinking in particular of the staff of PSIA, the Paris School of International Affairs, and its uh, Dean, Enrico Letta, um, of the uh, uh, Strategy and Development Division of Sciences Po, of Agathe Cagé, who's put a great deal of effort in, in setting up this, uh, this, this chair. And of course, I'm thinking of the professor who'll be uh, uh, the, the head of the chair, Stéphane Guibault, associate professor in our Department of Economics, who uh, will have a lot of work to complete in order to achieve all the, uh, all the targets that we've set for him at the head of the chair. Before I conclude, I would like to add just one thought, which is not directly connected to tonight's talk, Prime Minister. Uh, you may not have seen it when you walked into Sciences Po a few minutes ago, um, but there's a huge sign on the facade of our building reminding us that two of our researchers, Madame Fariba Adelha and Monsieur Roland Marshall, are currently being detained for no known reason in Iran. They have been prisoners for close to six months, some 175 days to be exact. And of course, we're working tirelessly with the French authorities to try and make uh, their situation a little more bearable and to try and hasten uh, their, um, their, 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 their freeing. Um, I would like to say that they are very much in our hearts this evening, and I would like to dedicate this lecture and this evening to our two colleagues. And this being said, I wish you all a very good lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frédéric. I would like to ask uh, Anne-Laure Kichel to take the floor and to introduce uh, our lecture today. Merci Frédéric pour ces mots. Merci Enrico d'accueillir cette nouvelle chaire dédiée à la dette souveraine au sein de l'École des affaires internationales. Merci Stéphane d'avoir accepté d'en prendre la direction scientifique. Merci à tous ceux qui se sont impliqués avec tant de cœur et de passion dans ce projet. Et bien sûr, merci à toi, camarade Alexis, de nous faire l'honneur d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui et d'avoir accepté de partager quelques fragments d'une odyssée grecque moderne. Alors, une chaire sur la dette. Mais qu'est-ce que la dette L'Oxford English Dictionary nous donne trois définitions possibles. La première, une somme due. La seconde, la situation du débiteur, en particulier celui qui ne peut pas payer. La troisième, un sentiment de gratitude pour une faveur ou un service rendu. La première définition semble tout à fait triviale, un chiffre comme un autre. Justement, parlons chiffres. L'ensemble de la dette mondiale devrait dépasser 230 trilliards d'euros cette année. Rien que sur les six premiers mois, la dette mondiale a augmenté de près de 7 milliards d'euros. L'augmentation est essentiellement due aux États-Unis et à la Chine. Cela signifie que chacun d'entre nous, chacun d'entre vous, est endetté en moyenne de 29 400 euros. Vous vous souvenez tous de la faillite de Lehman Brothers de 2008, de la crise financière. À ce moment-là, tout le monde se promettait plus jamais cela. Depuis, et sans que nous, citoyens, en prenions réellement conscience, l'ensemble des États a emprunté 27 000 milliards d'euros. La dette mondiale croit plus vite que l'économie. Et pourtant, les objectifs fixés par l'ONU en matière de développement durable nécessitent à l'horizon 2030 encore plusieurs centaines de milliards d'euros d'investissement. Comment les financer dans un environnement de croissance à tonnes si ce n'est essentiellement par de la dette Mais la dette, ce n'est pas une question de chiffres. Déjà, parce que les chiffres sont faux. Je vous parlais à l'instant de la dette visible. Il y a beaucoup de dettes invisibles, cachées, où l'homme a fait preuve de beaucoup d'ingéniosité. Je parle ici, par exemple, de garanties qu'un État peut donner pour une entreprise ou un projet. Engagement initialement non visible, qui devient bel et bien réel si la garantie est engagée. Ensuite, parce qu'il faut le dire, on, en, on ne remboursera pas toute la dette. Il y aura, comme il y aura toujours eu dans l'histoire, des faillites. Ceux qui étaient les États allemands, en faisant défaut huit fois, détiennent à date le record mondial. 
Il y aura des restructurations, certaines se produisant à intervalles réguliers avec la précision d'un métronome, comme en Argentine. Tous les acteurs de la dette le savent. La question est de savoir qui va payer. Et c'est ce qui doit et devrait nous préoccuper, parce que derrière les lignes d'endettement, les ratios, il y a des réalités concrètes, des réalités humaines. Le financement d'une école, d'un hôpital, de la route qui conduit à l'hôpital. Si le non-sens des 3 de déficit public passait à 4 la France disposerait des moyens d'augmenter d'un tiers l'investissement dans l'éducation nationale, notre premier budget, après celui du service de la dette. Derrière l'excédent primaire absurde que l'on a imposé aux Grecs, il y a des baisses de salaire, des enseignants en moins, des médecins en moins, l'impossibilité d'investir pour répondre aux besoins vitaux de tous, de respecter les droits fondamentaux. Il y a des conséquences immédiates dans la vie des vrais gens, la création structurelle d'inégalités. Comprendre ces enjeux et décider qui va payer sera au cœur de tout débat politique ces prochaines années. Va-t-on sacrifier les classes populaires, les classes moyennes sur l'autel de la dette Va-t-on accepter la plus injuste des inégalités, celle entre les générations Parce que ceux qui naissent aujourd'hui ne peuvent rien face aux engagements de leurs aînés, si ce n'est les subir ou les défaire. Il est indispensable que nous soyons des citoyens éclairés, suffisamment informés pour faire des choix. Notre ennemi, c'est l'ignorance. C'est pour cela que la seconde proposition de définition de la dette, la situation du débiteur, est intéressante. La question de la dette a depuis toujours structuré nos économies, nos rapports sociaux et jusqu'à nos représentations du monde. L'endettement est une construction sociale fondatrice du pouvoir, disait David Graeber. L'étymologie du mot « dette » est très intéressante. En allemand, la dette se dit « schuld » et signifie également « faute » et « culpabilité ». Au Mexique, dans les années 80, en Argentine, depuis les années 90, en Grèce, dans les années 2000, les créanciers ont pris le pouvoir vis-à-vis -vis des pays endettés. Le livre de Jérôme Ross, « Why not default ?», l'illustre parfaitement. Lorsque les créanciers imposent coûte que coûte des mesures d'austérité au pays, car ce qui importe par-dessus tout est d'exiger le paiement ininterrompu des coupons et d'échéances de dette, ils font fi de toutes conséquences sociales, de toutes conséquences démocratiques. La souveraineté d'une nation, d'un peuple, est bafouée, sur l'hôtel des remboursements d'intérêts. Pourquoi et comment accepter que le paiement des coupons de dette puisse passer avant les besoins vitaux des citoyens S'il faut maîtriser la technique de la dette pour bien l'appréhender, vous l'aurez compris, l'essentiel est ailleurs. La dette est un sujet éminemment politique. Chaque choix d'un État en matière de dette souveraine est un choix politique. Surendetter son pays en le mettant en situation de ne pas pouvoir honorer ses remboursements en cas de retournement économique est un choix politique. Contracter l'essentiel de la dette avec la Chine, a fortiori en livrant ses matières premières, n'est pas juste pour trouver des financements alternatifs à bas prix, c'est un acte politique. Un acte non sans conséquence sur sa souveraineté, à minima sur certains de ses composants. Un choix politique dont les citoyens doivent être informés et qu'ils doivent valider en conscience dans les urnes. Savez-vous, et aussi absurde que cela puisse paraître, qu'il n'existe actuellement pas de moyen de savoir en temps réel qui sont les détenteurs de la dette d'un pays on peut avoir des indications quant au gros détenteur, une information qui date de quelques semaines, de quelques mois, mais elle est imparfaite et certainement pas instantanée. On dit donc qu'actuellement, un chef de l'État, de n'importe quel pays, les États-Unis, la France, qui vous voulez, ne sait pas ici et maintenant qui détient précisément sa dette. Transposer cela dans le monde de l'entreprise, un PDG qui ignorerait l'identité de ses actionnaires, il serait à la merci de n'importe quel raid boursier et surtout, il serait viré. La création d'une dette d'une chaire dédiée à ce sujet si important, la dette, s'imposait. Parce que c'est un sujet dont on parle sans en comprendre réellement les enjeux et comment il engage chacun d'entre nous, comment il peut brutalement changer nos vies. Imaginez-vous un instant être un retraité grec. On vous a amputé ces dernières années de presque la moitié de votre retraite sans que vous ayez ni le choix ni un mot à dire. La chaire s'imposait parce que parler de dette, c'est parler de souveraineté, c'est parler d'indépendance des nations. Qui vous donne des ressources qui a le pouvoir d'exiger quoi que ce soit en retour Il importait d'y apporter une réponse française, européenne. J'espère que les enseignements de la chaire contribueront à vous nourrir et à vous armer intellectuellement pour comprendre les enjeux d'aujourd'hui et préparer les batailles de demain. Vous allez y apprendre à allier la théorie, la pratique, à travers des études de cas. Le premier sera consacré à la Grèce. Il va à l'implication de grands experts, d'académiques, de praticiens sur le sujet. Et au-delà de celles et de ceux qui ont été des acteurs de cette page d'histoire, certains sont là dans la salle. Avant de vous laisser tirer les leçons du cas grec avec Alexis Tsipras, je partage avec vous 
à l'heure des révoltes au Chili, en Équateur, au Liban, en Irak, un enseignement des civilisations mésopotamiennes à méditer. Si on souhaite éviter les explosions sociales, il faut savoir effacer les tablettes. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Anne-Laure. Uh, now it's time to give the floor to uh, Alexis uh, Tsipras. I would like just to say, after his lecture, we will have time for the usual Q&A session. You have two micros there. I'd like to ask you then to stand, uh, queuing by the micros, and then to prepare your questions. And I have to be very clear, questions are for students. For students. So please, the students uh, in the amphi to prepare your questions and to uh, prepare the Q&A with Alexis Tsipras. Alexis, you are the floor. So thank you very much. Uh, I never believed how interesting could be a lecture, uh, my lecture in in your university. I'm, I'm seeing so many people here today, so this is very nice. So I would like warmly thank the hosts for the invitation, Enrico Letta, Federic Mion, and of course, Anlor Kichel uh, for today's invitation. And I think that uh, this initiative is timely and this is an extremely important program, not uh, the initiative to create this new chair for the public debt. And this is important program, not uh, only, not just for France and Europe, but also for the rest of the world, particularly given uh, the common challenges raised by global sovereign debt. Yesterday I read uh, on web that uh, the estimation today for the public, the, 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 the global public debt is about 255 trillion euros. This is an amazing account. So I think that uh, given the common challenges raised by global sovereign debts and policies that have been used until now, by international institutions and states, it is very significant to know what is this in order to find a way to tackle. Let me start my speech for uh, my experience, our experience in Greece. Let me start the speech, the lecture, whatever you want for uh, what we faced when we came to power uh, after elections January 25 of 2015. It was at a time that uh, my country was at the height of an economic crisis that could either have been avoided, this is my opinion, or have had a much more manageable uh, uh, turnout. And I will try to explain why this crisis uh, could uh, have been avoided or have a much more manageable turnout. Greece faced a fiscal crisis that uh, led to a major debt crisis and the major financial crisis due to its uh, mismanagement before the crisis and during the, the crisis. And the experience of my country is uh, especially interesting for two reasons. First, because Greece constituted a systemic risk to the euro and therefore for, for, uh, to the stability of the European Union due to the large exposure 
of uh, major German and French banks to Greek government bonds. Nevertheless, it had a very small share of the European and world uh, GDP and correspondingly small share in the European or global uh, sovereign debt. Second, uh, second, because the case of Greece highlighted the major weaknesses of the Eurozone in uh, managing systemic risks. As we all know, since the Eurozone does not move ahead to a deepening of monetary and banking integration, it lacks the tools that, for instance, Fed has in the US to deal with similar crises. Finally, uh, because the Greek case clearly highlights the cynicism and uh, political hypocrisy displayed within Greece, as well as on European level, at the expense of a country that was explicitly treated as a guinea pig. So when Syriza took the power, took uh, office, we, are, we were already on the fifth consecutive year of uh, ineffective austerity programs which had already shrunk the country's GDP by 25%, and unemployment had reached 29% and 60% for young people, and the country was going through a severe economic depression, and uh, a large part of the population was on the verge of a humanitarian crisis. Debt uh, had uh, risen from uh, 124 prior to the bailout programs to about 184 after the implementation. And the fifth uh, review of the second bailout program, which was supposed to have been completed six months earlier, had never begun. So it was absolutely clear that uh, the first two fiscal policy programs, the first from May 2010 to March 2012, and the second from March 2012, had failed miserably. And most importantly, they failed not because they were not implemented properly, but precisely because they had been implemented. Their design had uh, doomed them to failure. So the medicine chosen caused more harm to the patient than the disease itself. Allow me, however, to take a step back and elaborate on the disease before I, I will try to talk about the bad medication. So how we, we, we got to the crisis? At first reading, the cause of the great, of the great Greek recession of 2010 till 2014 were the soaring twin deficits in public finances and the external trade balance exacerbated by the extremely low interest rates of the period following uh, the country's accession to the euro. Nevertheless, a closer look reveals that the real causes of the crisis are more deeper and rooted in the structural pathologies of Greek capitalism and the way the Greek political system operated in the decades following the 
reinstatement of democracy in 1974, reaching a peak just before and immediately after the country's, uh, uh, the country's accession to the euro area. So the causes were high public spending coupled with poor public investments lacking uh, an export-oriented economy. An extended clientelist regime uh, in place of an advan uh, advanced and fair welfare state. Very poor state revenues due to widespread of uh, tax evasion and low taxation of high incomes and so the constant creation of public deficits without coherent economic recovery strategy, even at the times of uh, strong growth. So it is these weaknesses of the economy that are responsible for inflating public debt to unsustainable levels. It is these weaknesses which led to the exclusion of the country from international markets in, uh, uh, at the, uh, 2010 and after that to the financial collapse. These causes and uh, devastating effects of Greece's inflated debt had been recognized and highlighted politically by the, le by the Greek left for a long time. Since the 80s, the Greek left had a consistent policy of criticism of uh, corrupt practices and public procurement and public works, the building of the clientelist regime by the two parties, the two government parties that time, New Democracy and PASOK, uh, the clientelism regime in public administration, the way the Olympian Games were funded, all the policy of arms uh, uh, purchases and military spending. This criticism was because it is the responsibility of the left to be, let me say, key enemy of distorted political economic practices that led to debt uh, creation. And we have to work in this direction even more in the future. But let me go back to the period in question. Uh, with the January election victory, the left in Greece had to restore the country's conditions for the, the reintegrating uh, into the international financial system so that the country could regain its national independence, sovereignty, that was uh, dramatically limited in the years uh, of crisis. And at the same time, the country had to continue all efforts to eliminate the structural causes that I, I tried to describe before. The structural causes that led to this collapse, which still reproduced several levels of inequalities. So that was the aim of uh, the negotiation, that was our aim in the negotiations at the very beginning, the first six uh, uh, months of 2015. We wanted to reach an honest deal, an honest agreement for a mild fiscal Consolidation Pact, accompanied, accompanied by, by uh, uh, the implementation uh, of uh, a plan of radical structural measures to tackle the real structural causes of debt creation. And at the same time, we wanted a more long-term radical solution to deal uh, with uh, public debt. Either in line with uh, the daring solution that uh, the international community gener generously offered 
to Germany. We have not to forget that in 1953, or at least through a serious uh, restructuring that uh, would have to come before, before the fiscal adjustment, in order to make it credible and effective. Unfortunately, we were confronted by a wall of conservative and uh, obsessively single-minded European political forces. And at the time, at the same time, we confronted the immoral stance of the fund, IMF, that was playing political games instead of having a technocratic approach. So we exhausted all margin of negotiation, and finally, we came to an agreement that uh, contained uh, several, but not all of our goals. So we did win a milder fiscal adjustment. We did win the protection of collective bargaining procedures, for, for instance, but not uh, an advanced debt relief settlement. A debt relief package was agreed later in 2018 instead instead not of 2015 instead of 2010 when the crisis began after much of our gdp was sacrificed and the necessary structural reforms were delayed but uh, regrettably this is i may say the key characteristic of nowadays europe too little too late and this uh, brings me to what I said earlier, that uh, this was the wrong treatment with uh, the wrong medication. Each bailout program designed by IMF includes at least three elements. Everybody knows that these three elements are this. First, debt sustainability analysis and negotiation on debt restructuring in cases where debt is regarded unsustainable. Second, devaluation of the national currency to counterbalance the recession effects that usually follow an adjustment program. And third, fiscal adjustment to correct macroeconomic imbalances. The case of Greece was an exception. Of course, devaluation of the currency could not be implemented as the country was member of a monetary union. And also because the IMF chose to play the political games of the strongest political forces and countries in Europe. The fund therefore chose, in order to facilitate the choice of Germany to bring, to bring it in the, into the program, not even to request the advanced restructuring of uh, the unsustainable public debt. Although this is always a precondition for financing a, a bailout program. Instead of that, IMF chose to amend its uh, statutes, its uh, uh, constitution, leaving the country facing a huge fiscal adjustment without counterbalancing measures. This is also one of the main reasons for the failure of the first two bailout programs and one of the root causes of the size and of the duration of the Greek recession. The responsibility, however, lies not only with the IMF, but also with, uh, the, with politicians who chose to impose a, bro a program that com combines with IMF and European institution in a tragic tango that brought on Greece the worst of, uh, the worst of both worlds, IMF austerity with a European ban on serious debt restructuring. 
and the responsibility lies also on those politicians who oppose the restructuring of the Greek debt in order to protect the interests of uh, European banks, thus uh, shifting the burden exclusively to the Greek taxpayers. For clearly, political reasons uh, that I think that we all know, some, uh, for political reasons, some uh, mediocre technocrats, let me say, who as it happens, unfortunately, still hold key positions in European bureaucracy, are now focusing on how much the cost of the six months delay was during the negotiation in 2015. They do so in order to avoid the core of the debate, which is the cost of their insistence on an unorthodox financial solution. And above all, in order to hide their hypocrisy when several years prior to 2015, they have been knowingly lying publicly about the sustainability, the sustainability of the Greek debt, when everybody knew that it was not sustainable. Of course, I, uh, I do not deny that history has to acknowledge the fact that uh, Europe provided a very substantial financial support to Greece. If Greece uh, had not borrowed more than uh, 200 billion euros, it would have uh, defaulted and uh, been driven out of the Eurozone. But at the same time, it must be recognized that this support came at a huge social and economic price and with conditions that made recovery even more difficult. No one can uh, turn a blind eye to the enormous responsibilities that European politicians have for the duration and for the depth, depth of the Greek uh, crisis, which uh, caused at the end of the day which cost in the reduction of our GDP by 25%, which cost 1.5 million people unemployed, which cost, at the end of the day, a whole nation in despair. Allow me a brief mention to the very memoranda that uh, a combined uh, the loan agreements and where the price that Greece uh, had paid for and uh, this, this memoranda were, were the price that Greece uh, uh, pay, had paid for uh, the settlement for the restructuring of the debt. Let me from the start say the following which I think is very clear. The restructuring of the debt loans to Greece and economic programs are not three independent elements of the adjustment program that are disconnected. The restructuring of the, of the debt, the disbursements uh, of the loans by our creditors in trusts in return for the measures taken on the basis of the economic programs uh, constitutes a unified mechanism, constitutes a technology of discipline, let me say. The message was clear and consistent uh, by the institutions. If you do not implement a tough neoliberal policy, we will let you go bankrupt. You will have to do, as we say, in terms of both output and methods, or you will have to fend for yourselves. 
I focus on this, uh, on, on, on three points that are the most problematic in uh, the policies of the economic programs. First is uh, the internal devaluation itself, uh, which is the hard score of the first uh, two bailout programs. Second is the obsessiveness of the representatives of the creditors on secondary issues, not in structural reforms necessarily, necessary structural reforms from, from the country, but secondary issues that left the structural weaknesses of the Greek economy intact. And third, the excessive and, uh, and uh, deliberately pessimistic fiscal predictions of the IMF during the period 2015-2018, uh, which led the adjustment consistently to a dead end. Predictions with which the European institutions uh, in the end would uh, consistently more or less accept under the pressure uh, uh, from Germany. So I will try to very briefly to make some comments on these three uh, points. On the first issue about the internal devaluation, I don't think I, I, I need to say so much things on that. The number one goal of the institutions and especially the IMF from the outset was to decrease of wage and salary costs in public and private sector. But also the deregulation of the labor market through more flexible working conditions and uh, the overturning of collective bargaining procedures. A common and uh, incorrect presupposition by all institutions was, after all, that the decreased competitiveness of Greece was due to the increased labor costs and uh, due to the inflexi uh, inf in in inflexible labor market. And as everybody knows, this is not true. This is not true according to uh, all available research. On the second issue, about the ob obsessiveness of uh, the representatives of the, credit of the creditors, probably I could come back later, but I would only want to say that instead of uh, the institutions using their experience and using their authority to help correct the structural weaknesses of Greece, of, of Greek public administration especially, and uh, to help uh, and correct the structural weaknesses of the economy, they worked simply to transmit and impose the will, I will say it, I will say it clearly, the will of vested interests. Hundreds of uh, hours on negotiations were lost and political capital were lost because the institutions focused on secondary demands of vested interest, interests or on secondary e uh, issues such as, uh, such as how many Sundays per year uh, shops will be open, uh, which medicine would be sold at the supermarkets or which kind of milk could be labeled as fresh, secondary issues. But they never insisted so much to help in combating corruption, hitting corruption, in making the judicial system faster or concluding the land registry. So I come to the third issue, which is uh, maybe the most infuriating. 
the issue of uh, deliberately pessimistic fiscal predictions of the fund, which uh, consistently found a gap in our uh, finances uh, and ended up delaying uh, unnecessarily the conclusion uh, of uh, reviews and undermining the return of uh, the economy to growth. The obsessiveness of uh, the IMF on uh, specific, specific reforms, like the, for instance, the eradication of VAT exceptions uh, for certain Aegean islands, the decrease of the tax credit, uh, or uh, the new round of decreases in pensions was so big that uh, it was ridiculed by international experts. Just to give you an example, at the moment when the Greek economy since 2016 had budgetary surpluses close to or close to or over of 4%, the IMF predicted budgetary surpluses of 0.1 or to close to 1% only. And the worst of all was that European creditors saw the uh, evident mistakes in predictions, but in the end always more or less accepted the IMF assessments in order to keep it in the program while the Greek citizens paid the price. I could speak uh, much more on the experience of negotiations, but, uh, but what is important, I think, is to keep in mind that uh, the debt was used to impose specific austerity policies that were directly linked to a constant vicious uh, circle uh, in these negotiations. So let me say this, the game was very simple. The IMF will tell us to convince the European institutions on the need for debt restructuring in uh, return for, higher, for lighter austerity measures. At the same time, the European institutions will respond that no debt restructuring was possible and we had to convince the IMF why lighter austerity measures were possible. And this was a ping pong game but everybody knew uh, who could win this game and uh, who could uh, be defeated. Of course, in the end, after great efforts by the government and great sacrifices by the Greek people, at last, an agreement on uh, restructuring uh, on restructuring of the debt was reached. So I could say that uh, after this agreement on the restructuring of the debt in June 2018, Greek debt now is sustainable on the basis of some clear and specific economic presuppositions. So in order to wrap up, uh, I think that there are two key lessons that uh, we had concluded from the first two Greek economic programs. First, that the restructuring of the debt had to be an integral part of the adjustment process. And secondly, that the restructuring had to be seizable without conditionalities in order to be credible. The third program, as I said before, transferred the process of restructuring of the debt to the adjustment period, despite our uh, persistence uh, that uh, it should have come before rather than after. Nevertheless, this allowed, allowed uh, the, the, the adoption of a realistic path to fiscal adjustment precisely because uh, of the consistent efforts of the government. And uh, 
it uh, contributed in a crucial way to the stabilization of the economy, uh, the successful conclusion of uh, the program, and the return of the country to uh, the international markets in a sustainable way. Even under specific economic uh, presuppositions, it is predicted that the gross fiscal needs of the country will not be over 15% of GDP in 40 years, while the risk uh, from uh, a worsening of interest rates in the medium term is small, since to a great extent the debt has stable interest rates and uh, a long average uh, maturity. So, in conclusion, I can say that, uh, that ensuring the sustainability of Greece's sovereign debt was one of the most important successes of uh, my government, of the Syriza government. This is what I believe. But I want to underline that the challenge of sovereign debt is clearly not over, not for Greece, for Europe is not over. Many countries at this moment in the European, in, in the European Union deal with this challenge and the question we have to pose is the following. Will we allow, will we allow every country to confront this problem alone because of the fear that a common European policy will create a moral hazard? Or are we going to try to change the, the, the dominant paradigm and move in the direction of a stronger and more coherent Europe? I think that this is the crucial question. And it is clear that European economic growth is uh, an uh, uh, integral part of this common European policy because the speed of decreasing public debt in Greece and the European uh, periphery uh, depends also on the rate of economic growth in the rest of Europe. In uh, an uh, environment uh, of very low or maybe negative interest rates that nowadays we have, countries like Germany, the Netherlands or even France uh, should endorse fiscal stimulus policies and invest in infrastructure programs without the fear of increasing their own debt as a percentage of GDP uh, with important benefits, with important benefits for them, uh, for, the for the economic stability, and of course, uh, with the important benefits for the rest of Europe. What's, the, central, what's, what's, what's the, the basic obstacle on that? The basic obstacle to such a plan is the forces of intertia and the fear that debt could uh, uh, once more spiral out of control. Nevertheless, the economic facts on the basis of which European economic and monetary policy has been carried out, call now for more braver decisions, for much braver decisions. I think uh, it is uh, very important that uh, the discussion has begun in Europe. It is very important that President Macron opened this uh, discussion on Eurozone reform when he came to Greece in Pnix, uh, near to Acropolis, in his speech, and today he insists on a new discussion on uh, reforming the stability pact. It is also important that even Novo, uh, Olaf Scholz has opened again the discussion on the joint European uh, deposit insurance. And of course it is important that France and Germany have agreed to a revitalization of the dialogue uh, on the future of Europe. But the question still remains. The question is if the political will is there for brave decisions. 
And the, allow me this question to put uh, for you also. It belongs to you. You will try to answer. Thank you very much. <laughs>